with only my camera. I came to see in whose hands this country was left. There is weapons, and it seems like these weapons can be fixable. So they started to fix, in the beginning, they started to fix the rifles. And I was like, okay, that's the maximum. But then they started to fix more trucks. And then I was like, that's it. And then they would fix um, tanks. And then it goes to starting to fix the airplanes. All of that I didn't expect it to happen. The Americans has claimed that they have destroyed everything behind them. We've seen them destroying. I've seen the reports of them destroying their base bases and uh, everything should have been destroyed already. So what I understood is what I understood from the very first second that there is not only the things that were left behind for the Afghan National uh, Army, which is the army of the previous government and the U.S. has prepared to fight the Taliban, but there's only things, there's also things left behind the U.S. that belong to the U.S., not just the things that were left for, for, for the Afghan National Army. And you quickly realize that the number that they have seen have said in the beginning, which is 7.12 uh, billion US do dollars worth of weapon, uh, uh, weaponry is way lower than the real number because that number is only what they left for the Afghan National Army. So that number does not contain the base or anything inside the base because the base has officially been completely destroyed and yet it's still existent. I never expected that they would fix anything. Even there was one scene when he was walking, Marlon Mansour was, walk, was walking with the head of the head of the uh, the technical team that's fixing the airplanes, and he was like, "Did you fix the black box?" And he said, "Yes." And he's like, "Now focus on the thirty-five bombers." There's a little shake on the camera because I did this behind the camera because I didn't believe that they fixed anything. I thought, "Ah, yeah, we fixed it." I thought that he's just talking nonsense. And in our culture, we would meet. A a lot of people that they don't know and they say they know. So that's why I expected that he doesn't know anything. He's just saying we fixed it. And when I saw them flying, I realized that the problem is in me. I thought that I just underestimated the people in front of me. But they are able to fix Black Hawks, but not save quite um, some medicines. That it's tells what kind of regime they are building. Uh, the regime that would make a wife, that he would make his wife, who is a doctor, sit at home. Uh, and not do her work, although if he had let her do her work, she would have saved all of these medicines. And he focuses only on fixing the weapons and the medicine. Do you go bad? Oh, no, it's just the head, the, 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 doctor, the head doctor is lazy to fix all of these airplanes that were officially announced by the US that they will never be fixed. So he's done something extraordinary. Um, and in my eyes, he's just... Um, ignorant, he doesn't know how to calculate 67 times 100. So that day, my head was was flipping on, 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 on that fact of I'm so ignorant. I am the ignorant one in that conversation because I think I know more, but actually I don't know what I don't know. And of course, I was afraid. I was afraid seeing all of that um, running, knowing how powerful um, they have become. And uh, Did you think that they were going to kill you? Kill is a big word, you know. I don't think they would. I I didn't think they would kill me. But um, the least could have, the least that could happen is that I leave the country without any of the material that I have on on me. That's the least that could happen. Or they could um, arrest me. I, I don't know. I I I don't try to um to be able to live within within this very dangerous space. I had to convince myself every single day that I could survive. And whatever it will be, will be. So if they kill me, they kill me. No? I accepted the risk that I took. I accepted that it's fearful to be there. I was never feeling safe. I'm dealing with people who are very impulsive, suffering from PTSD. So I never felt safe. Uh, so the morning of the, the, morning of the, of the parade, as you see in the film, uh, when they were preparing to go there, the leaders came, all of them came to the airport, and they were sitting in one room when I entered that room. And after I entered that room, the Secret Service came to me and said, you have to come to our office tomorrow and bring all of your footage. And one of the people I was filming with for a little bit was the head of the Air Force, of the Secret Service. So that's why they didn't really um, give me a hard order. They were like, okay, he knows the our head, so we have to make a, a nice request. But I directly clocked, uh, understood this is a clock. If you tell me, if you send your Secret Service to me to go to their office, I know it's going to go only down a stop from that moment. So I said to myself, today is your last day of shooting. Do as much as you could, finish everything. And the moment you're done, you run to the airport and leave the country.
um, you're not going to go to the Secret Service office tomorrow. And this is what happened. By the time we got back to Kabul from, from Bagram, from the from the uh, parade, I directly went to the airport and I, I, I fled the country.